numbers across America. Just how historically bad these unemployment numbers are. Protests against police brutality across the country. United, we can and will overcome this season of darkness in America. Where Joe Biden sees American darkness, I see American greatness. I'll be an ally of the light, not the darkness. Together, we are taking back our country. We are returning the power to you, the American people. We are in a battle for the soul of this nation. We will make America great again. The question Why because, would you answer that because question? The you question want to put is, a lot of the new question Supreme is, Court is the radical question, left. Will you shut up, your, man? The best is yet to come. People are joining us, so so I'm going to. Uh, I'm not going to reveal what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. <laughs> I'm going to run briefly through the editorial of our new issue, to which Anira kindly contributed. Um, and then I'm going to very briefly uh, present your respective uh, biographies. And then I'm going to let you say one or two words, if you feel like saying one or two words. And then I'm going to dive into questions. Um, I hope this is going to, I'm sure this is going to be a very spirited discussion on the eve of a very, uh, we'll see, historic maybe, an election for America and, and, and one for the rest of the world, to be honest. Or two. So I'm going to ask my guys if we are okay to start. If people are joining us, fine. So we're, we're good to go. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and good morning to you uh, who are joining uh, us from America. Thank you very much for following and supporting the, world, the work of the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development, uh, Southeast Europe's leading foreign policy think tank, uh, as well as publisher of uh, Horizons, Journal of International Relations and Sustainable Development, uh, the only such publication from our part of the world that uh, has become uh, available on JSTOR, uh, the global number one academic uh, online platform. This is a season of darkness. This great statement resonates in a way both like a moral indictment and uh, a description of something sinister afoot. Uh, but these words uh, were not directed uh, at a foreign country uh, or spoken by an enemy of America. Rather, they were uttered by a US presidential candidate placing the blame for America's stumbles squarely on the shoulders of his opponent. Uh, to be fair, the divisions plaguing America predate the arrival of the current occupant of the most powerful office in the world. They are unlikely to be overcome simply by his departure, whether now or in four years from now. Um, after all, neither did the unipolar moment end on his watch nor did the doctrine of global indispensability come into question uh, with uh, his election. Uh, fervent geopolitical rivalries did not suddenly appear as he took the oath of office, uh, and the sclerotic state of international multilateral institutions did not first appear during history. Similarly, uh, inequality of opportunity and social injustice are in novel challenges to the American body politic. The Black Lives Matter movement may be new, but the tradition of vigorously demonstrating for change has a long and storied history in America. Debates on tax, wages, trade, law enforcement, and immigration policies are hardly new either. Uh, the distrust in government is likewise a long-standing issue, as is the deterioration of the country's infrastructure. 
The media landscape has been polarized for many years and the corrosive effects of special interests on the conduct of the affairs of state go back a century or more. Nevertheless, the present moment feels particularly disorienting. Hence the overriding theme of the present edition of Horizons, America at Crossroads. Perhaps the absence of clear leadership in the fight against the coronavirus pandemic, both at home and abroad, has brought to bear a somewhat heightened sense of urgency. America appears to be in a state of waffle terness to cite one of our distinguished contributors. All told, and however much they may disagree on particulars, the authors we feature in our new issue of Horizons, ranging from Brett Stevens and Grover Norquist to uh, Wolfgang Ischinger, Kishore Mabubani, and Dmitri Trenin. Uh, they hold in common a disquieting feeling that America is in a singularly profound crisis. However, America remains the world's most powerful nation. And consequently, much of the planet will join those who cast their vote in trepidatiously awaiting the outcome of this November's plebiscite. Uh, its result will most likely determine the course of events for many years to come, not just in America, but for all of humanity. This afternoon, uh, we are truly privileged to have with us uh, two outstanding intellectuals and policy experts, both with extensive experience in American presidential campaigns, uh, some victorious and some not. Both of them, uh, I'm happy to say, good friends of mine. Uh, first of all, Neera Tunden, um, an arch Democrat. <laughs> Uh, she's a president and the CEO of the Center for American Progress, uh, one of the leading uh, Washington uh, liberal progressive think tanks. Uh, prior to joining uh, the Center for American Progress, prior to becoming the head of the Center for American Progress, um, she uh, served as a senior advisor uh, for health reform in the Obama administration that launched the historic Affordable Care Act or Obamacare. Uh, prior to that, she was the director uh, for domestic policy for Obama Biden presidential campaign uh, where she managed all domestic policy proposals. She also served as policy director for Hillary Clinton's first presidential campaign where she directed all policy work and oversaw the debate preparation for the then Senator Clinton. Uh, Nira is uh, truly one of the most prominent people in Washington's uh, political circles. And she is constantly in these uh, top uh, league tables published by several uh, American magazines like uh, uh, National Journalist Washington's Most Influential Women, uh, Fortune Magazine's Most Powerful Women in Politics, and Politico's Magazine, Top 50 Thinkers, Doers, and Visionaries in American Politics. Um, she contributed to Horizons both in the past and for the current issue, and I had the privilege of working with her as the head of CAP in the past where we organized a joint conference, CIRSD and CAP in Washington a few years ago. Uh, Richard Fontaine, um, lifelong Republican. He is uh, the chief executive officer of the Center for a New American Security, formerly president of the same institution. Uh, he was in the past foreign policy advisor to Sen Senator John McCain. Um, he worked uh, in various positions at the State Department, at the National Security Council, and on the staff of the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, Mr. Fontaine served as foreign policy advisor to John McCain's 2008 presidential 
campaign, the same campaign uh, when Mira was on the other side working for Barack Obama and Joe Biden. So Mira uh, was uh, a bit more successful back then in 2008. Uh, but uh, Mr. Fontaine currently serves as the executive director of the Trilateral Commission uh, and has been an adjunct professor in security studies program at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Also a contributor to Horizons in the past and also a guest of the CIRSD in Belgrade uh, a few years ago. Uh, two good friends and uh, two great experts on American domestic and foreign policy. Nira, Richard, welcome to this uh, webinar. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you with us. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. Thank you, and also thank you for your very kind words. That was very generous of you. Well, thank you, both of you. And I suggest that uh, we uh, dive into questions. There is a lot of ground to cover. We have an uh, audience who is very excited to hear from you. So I'm going to start off with Nira. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first question to Nira is, uh, is America in a crisis? And if it is, how did we end up in this place? Uh, well, yes, I would say America is in uh, a particular crisis. Uh, it's been um, the most riven, politically riven, it's been over the last four years. Uh, where you know we have a level of division and hostility uh, between Americans that I've never seen in my life. I think that is borne by the kind of politics we have, which is the kind of questions we're asking ourselves, which are you know so much more fundamental than politics was in 2008 when Richard and I were on two different campaigns. Um, you know, the kinds of questions America is asking uh, in the Trump era is really, you know, who are Americans? Uh, who, who does the country really serve? Does it serve everybody? You know, I think in previous eras, uh, you know, just hearkening back to the 2008 campaign, there wasn't that much there, you know, there were difference in policy views and difference in outlooks for sure, but there were not differences in, you know, kind of com conceptions of uh, who America, you know, who's really American, who's um, who America is for war. Um, and, you know, I think that's really driving a lot of the anger. And I think, you know, I, I, I go back and forth on this question about, you know, when did this crisis start or how did it happen? But I think we can't underestimate in history, how much uh, particular leaders can drive events. And America may well have been, um, uh, you know, very divided in 2012 or 2016, but having, a, you know, in my view, having a president like President Trump who seeks division, who ex doesn't just exploit division, who seeks it out and revels in it and uses, as a, uses it as a political cudgel is you know, extraordinary and deeply different than most Republican leaders in American history. And I think that is one of the reasons why uh, you see so many Republicans uh, speaking out against him and uh, campaigning against him, and at this point, in some states, voting against him, <laughs> and um, you know, so uh, I, I, I think there's a tendency to say um, so much about you know what gave rise to Trump, and you know, truthfully, we are seeing the rise of authoritarian populists and democracies throughout the world. So it is not just an American phenomenon, but those leaders you know, those leaders can create events into the future that exacerbate dramatically the kinds of tensions that exist in the country. And so, you know, my hope is this, we're now seven days from our election. 
I hope that in the United States, we see a repudiation of this kind of politics. And I, I think we can't underestimate how different it will feel to have a, perhaps have a president who is not trying to stoke those divisions. You know, Joe Biden has a, the almost opposite message, which is that he will be a president for people who vote for him and people who vote against him, uh, which is, you know, a deeply different and alternative and opposite message. We'll get to that. I'm going to ask sure. Richard a slightly different, uh, differently worded question, but essentially the same. Um, is America truly at crossroads? Uh, actually, did we get it right or wrong with the front page, with the cover page of our magazine? Uh, is America at crossroads? And, uh, and what's, in your view, Richard, at stake here? Yeah, I think uh, America is at a crossroads. Um, we all told ourselves that the 2016 election was the most important election of our lifetimes. And it was until then. And now the 2020 election, I think, is more important still. Um, and, and to go back to the, point, the question that you posed to Nira, I think the United States is quite obviously in uh, a certain degree of crisis on multiple levels. I mean, first, we're do Nira and I are doing this from home because we can't actually leave our houses to go to our workplace. Um, and we're, you know, eight, nine, 10 months into this pandemic and the number of infections yesterday was higher than at any point uh, throughout. You know, there's 80,000 infections a day now in the United States. If that's not a health crisis, I don't know what it is. If it's not a failure of uh, government to get a hold of at least mitigating the effects of this, and I don't know what it is, economic crisis, we've got unemployment rate that's still near 9% that disproportionately is hurting the people at the lower end of the income spectrum who can't do their work on Zoom all day and things like that. And then the political crisis. So we've got, you know, this year we've had protests in the streets, a president who has declined to commit to a peaceful transfer of power, a Supreme Court justice who yesterday was named with a, on a completely partisan vote. So all Democrats opposing and all Republicans supporting. Um, I mean, these are, this is, wherever you come down on some of these specific questions, this is evidence of a very deep divide, um, actually multiple divides uh, in the American um, political system. And, uh, you know, some of, if you look back in American history, frankly, the best way to resolve these is with an election. I mean, this is one reason you have elections so that people can hold their leaders accountable. And if they don't like what's happened over the past four years and they can change the government. Um, and it's harder to think of a more uh, stark contrast between two candidates and what the next four years would look like for the country than between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And um, so in that sense, I think uh, the United States really is at a crossroads and you know, four more years of Donald Trump, I think probably looks like the last four years, but with fewer constraints because the major incentive of needing to get reelected would not be uh, a constraint. Um, and four years of Joe Biden would look much, I think, more conventional. And at this point in our nation's history, I think we need a lot more conventional <laughs> than, than uh, uh, very well. Uh, your, your former boss, late uh, Senator John McCain, did consider at some point uh, upon winning uh, the nomination from the GOP uh, to reach across the aisle and to have a uh, Senator Lieberman uh, as his running mate. This was in the cards yep. and then happening, but it was, it was in the cards. And now you just mentioned this vote, this like super partisan vote on the Supreme Court, uh, total division between the Democrats and the Republicans. Um, could you imagine, we're not gonna talk about Donald Trump for a second because he obviously wouldn't be the person to contemplate such a possibility, but uh, did, for example, Joe Biden uh, had a chance to think whether to reach across the aisle and in a similar way to John McCain to try and think of uh, having a uh, 
running mate would be uh, a Republican back in 2008, it was a possibility. Right now, do you see such a possibility uh, ever again in American politics or in the near future? Are you asking me uh, or Richard? Both of you guys, both of you guys. Go ahead, Richard. Well, you know, it's it's always hard to have a running mate from another party, um, but, but, but. Creates but, an odd, dis it creates an odd, odd incentive structure. Yeah, I mean, um, however, <laughs> but there's a point, there's a there's a broader point behind what you're saying, what you're asking, and I think what you're asking is, can we get back to something that looks more unified and bipartisan than what we've got now? And I think the answer is yes. I mean, you know, and again, look, I, I worked on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee when Joe Biden was the, uh, was the ranking member. I worked for John McCain when Joe Biden was in the Senate, and then when he was Vice President of the United States for a short time. And he was quite often a deal maker with people on the other side of the aisle. Even when he was vice president, the government shut down. The state shut down until Joe Biden got involved and struck a deal with Mitch McConnell to, to get it back open. So um, we don't, it's, I don't think it's inevitable that America is going to be this politically divided forever, that this will be the tone forever, that it will be this hard to get things done forever. There are certain things that you know, sort of structural changes that have happened that, and political incentives that I think make it harder to get back to the era where, for example, in the, the Supreme Court justice who was confirmed yesterday replaced a Supreme Court, Court justice who was very liberal and was confirmed by more than 90 votes in the, in the US Senate. I don't think we're getting back to that anytime soon, but we can certainly do a lot better than where we are now. And that's where leadership does matter. It, depends on whether your fundamental starting point is that you your political incentives are aligned with getting deals and producing consensus around solutions or by dividing people and sort of energizing a, an element of the population. And those are two fundamentally different starting points. Would you agree with yeah. that, Mira? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that uh, I think, first of all, I, I, I would imagine that there will be Republicans in a Biden cabinet. Um, and, uh, but I, I think I, I really want to reject the notion that there's symmetric polarization in the United States. There is not symmetric polarization in the United States. The two parties are not, you know, on two pole ends and they're both <laughs> very, you know, they're both, uh, equally divided, just look at the candidates. Donald Trump is far more um, conservative, ideologically right than Joe Biden, who won his primary as a moderate and has been a moderate throughout. And if you look at the races in the United States, the Senate candidates that are running as Democrats throughout the country, uh, you know, they're they're very moderate candidates. One is a former Republican in Kansas, who's a Republican two years ago. So I, I mean, I and if you actually look at what's happened in Democratic primaries over the last several years, uh, moderates have won swing state primaries. That is not the case of Republicans. Republicans have not rewarded moderates in elections. And that is why the parties are very different in, in what is and what they're putting forward. And I, I mean, just to be honest, I really don't think the issue in the United States is just that people just, you know, political leaders just choose not to get along. I think the issue in the United States is the parties are polarized, but they asymmetrically do so. And I, I mean, I think the Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court fight is an example of that. So, you know, my hope is that we'll have, Jib, like I, my actual hope in this election is that this is a, uh, a repudiating loss for the Republican party and that Republicans come to, you know, decide that it's more important to win swing elections with moderate candidates. And then we can get back to an era where we have the likes of John McCain and a Joe Biden making deals across the aisle. But, you know, we're, when Donald Trump is the face of the Republican Party and not John McCain, that is a big, substantial difference that drives political action. Okay, let me push you back a little on that and let me play devil's sure. advocate for, for, uh, for a second. Happy uh, to. <laughs> a lot of people uh, are saying that uh, Donald Trump has done some 
good things in the past four years, like uh, there is a, uh, a renegotiated uh, NAFTA that is uh, mm -hmm. in the better interest of America and ultimately ended up being accepted by the Canadians and the Mexicans. And, and some people would say that the economy was doing really well before this uh, pandemic um, and so on and so forth. Um, is there anything Nora, in the past four years uh, for which you believe that uh, the US government, the Trump administration actually deserves credit? I mean, the, the reality is that the United States has, um, uh, you know, one of the, the wealthiest country in the world has the worst results for the COVID response of really any country like us. <laughs> and the fact that over 200,000 people have died in the United States in large measure because of the incompetence of the Trump administration seems to me to trump any accomplishment of the Trump administration. Are there some, you know, are there some accomplishments? Sure, you can look at them, but then generally speaking, they you tend to find the holes in them. The USMCA is not radically different from the NAFTA agreement. The United States um, unilateral trade war with China has not did not actually deliver results for China for the United States. It, you know, basically we paid the the tariffs, and the Chinese have not altered their behavior. The economy was doing well, but even with the economy doing well, the inequality was growing, and the median wages while up, we still had dramatic, dramatic levels of inequality in the country. And just to put a fine point on it, the president who promised to end outsourcing did absolutely no such thing. And one last point, the United States trade deficit with China was at its highest point ever in American history in September. So I think when you actually walk through the results of the administration's policies, they have not been a success. I mean, I'm definitely not a fan of Donald Trump, but I think I can actually look at the facts. And, you know, I think one of the questions is given his, you know, it, to, in my mind, it's a sense of the polarization that we have a president who has failed so miserably with the virus and two, you know, 65% of Americans think he's, it's like actually bipartisan issue that, you know, a lot of Americans think he's failed with the virus. And yet, you know, he's still at like 40, 42%. So, um, you know, that is a testament to polarization in my mind, uh, not to anything else. Okay, I'm gonna ask Richard the same question, but, but before I give him the floor, uh, I'm just gonna, you know that there's one thing where where I know that uh, you've been working on for a very long time with Senator McCain and in your other capacities, which is uh, which is NATO. And uh, and one of the things that Trump likes to boast about is that uh, he pushed ally. Well, let's not talk about what kind of atmospheric atmosphere you have right now in NATO, but uh, but one of uh, the the facts, if I'm not mistaken, is that. Uh, allies in NATO, they're making bigger contributions now to NATO than they were in the past. And some could argue that this is perhaps uh, an achievement, but be that one or any other one. Uh, Richard, do you think that there are things worth praise in the last four years of the USG? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, I think the economy was doing well overall and unemployment was very low before coronavirus hit, um, you know, on the stuff that I focus on, on the foreign policy matters, you know, the normalization between Israel and some key Arab countries like Bahrain and uh, UAE and, and Sudan. I mean, it's, it's pretty hard to get diplomatic wins in the Middle East. Um, that was certainly not a panacea, but it was a diplomatic win. And I think they deserve credit for it. Um, you know, the, the administration, I think, has taken a more realistic line on China than past administrations. It eliminated ISIS's territorial caliphate. Um, and, you know, if we were sitting here a few years ago, we would be talking a lot about ISIS and the threat that poses to the United States and our allies. Um, you know, there, so there, there, there are ways. I mean, certainly when you net it out, there's a reason why as a Republican, I'm supporting Joe Biden rather than Donald Trump. Um, 
but I do think there are accomplishments um, that they deserve credit for. You know, NATO um, is a strange uh, question right now because you have a real mishmash of uh, presidential rhetoric and some of the underlying policies and so forth. So, for example, you have um, uh, work that's being done with NATO in terms of the European Deterrence Initiative and other things like that, all of which are, are good and this administration has done. On top of that, you have Trump wanting to pull troops out of Germany for not any particularly good reason, um, other than it seems to be sort of punitive. Uh, you have him sort of haranguing NATO allies to pay 2% of GDP, or as he says, pay their bills, which is not the way it works. But, um, and, and the reality is, yes, NATO countries have paid more uh, for their own defense, probably in part because of the haranguing from Washington and probably in part because the increased Russian menace is focusing the minds of people in Europe to quite an extent. And it's hard to disentangle those two causes, but they're probably both at work. Um, and you know, it's good for European uh, countries and NATO countries to to pay more for their defense and to to burden share more. But even there, you have to look at what's the best measure of the value of an ally to the United States. And I would say it's not really whether they pay two percent of their GDP against defense and how they spend that money. Is it on defense modernization or on you know uh, pensions? Do they, do they, are they active in the fights that NATO gets into or not? Um, what is their actual capacity and capability? So, um, you know, the, it is true that it's, I think, induced allies to pay more, but I worry about the cost associated with that because the view among NATO countries of the United States as an ally and vice versa has gotten so bad right now that you can weigh that against the increases in defense spending. You've got to ask yourself whether this is the NATO that we want right now. And I, can I just add a, a quick sure. point to that? I think there's a, you know, when I, when I'm in, when I used to be in Europe before the pandemic, there was, you know, there's this, there's this sense that, um, you know, the real legitimacy behind uh, uh, Trump's argument on NATO is that, you know, American taxpayers are really tired of paying for NATO. You know, he makes that argument. But I, I would just note factually that the American taxpayer is paying more for the U.S. military budget than that taxpayer has ever paid. Our budget is at the highest it's ever been. <laughs> and uh, I mean, maybe not a uh, Per capita, based on the um, based on the, at the height of the Cold War, but we are paying more than we've paid in 20 years for the U.S. military budget, and uh, at the same time that NATO is uh, increasing its ante. So it's not that NATO's increase or a NATO allies increase is actually reducing the burden of the military in the United States. It's doing no such thing. And I would just really highlight how if you are deeply concerned about a rising China or, uh, you know, um, have any anxiety about Russia and its uh, interests in the world, then the repudiation of America's allies is a, is a deep problem. The notion that we live in a time where the president praises authoritarians and rebukes democratic allies that have been, you know, at the cornerstone of the U.S.-Europe relationship for decades is, you know, is an, an upside down world, honestly. And it's even a more upside down world today if you think that the 21st century will be a, a competition of ideas between authoritarian countries and democracies. And, you know, the, this is a moment where democracies need to be um, more closely working together to uh, limit the spread of authoritarianism, not uh, not attacking each other, uh, which only serves to undermine, only serves to aid uh, the opponents of democracy. Thank you. Let me let me now shift gears and get into something uh, that is uh, deeply traumatic and uh, and very domestic uh, mm -hmm. to do with the uh, with the American uh, with the current American debate. Um, I'm going to ask you, Nira, first, and then, and then also I'd like to hear Richard's view about the Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And my question is, 
only four years ago, we had the end of an historic uh, African-American presidency. Uh, first African-American was voted not once, but twice into the White House. And uh, a lot of people thought that uh, this was like an apex and the end of a long lasting debate on race in American politics, but only four years after the end of Obama's presidency, you have Black Lives Matter and uh, serious uh, locomotions related to race in America. So why did it happen? And how this, how this whole thing seems to be getting back and to the, uh, to the heart of American domestic political debate? Well, I think if people believed that electing Barack Obama was a sign that racism had ended in the United States, that was a mistake. <laughs> the United States, I mean, if you know, if you go through history, the entire history of the country, um, it is a story of uh, racism, acts again, you know, steps to repudiate racism backlash, and then additional steps forward. You know, if we go through the entire history of the country, it is, we go from slavery, slavery to abolition, to reconstruction, to a massive backlash of <laughs> reconstruction, to Jim Crow, to the civil rights uh, movement, to uh, the eighties and Southern strategy, and then Barack Obama and then Donald Trump. So. Throughout our history, we have, you know, I hope in the long arc of history, two steps forward and one step back. I, I will say that we had uh, acts of police brutality and violence against Black people during the Obama years. Eric Garner uh, died, um, you know, a Sarah Trayvon Martin, a series of cases di uh, dominated the headlines. They did not lead to the national, really countrywide protests we had. In fact, the two largest political demonstrations in American history have taken place during the Trump era. First, the Women's March, which was at that point, the largest political mar series of marches and in, in, that had the most people of any event in American history. And then only to be topped by the George Floyd protests, which took part, took place all over the country in rural parts of the country, suburban parts of the country and urban parts of the country. And I think a key difference between the events um, in response to George Floyd and the events in response to Eric Garner or Trayvon Martin or the, the cases that happened during the uh, Obama era or the Obama presidency is a belief in some form of justice. I do believe that we had nationwide protests that involved every corner of the country post George Floyd's murder, and I believe it is a murder, because there's not there there was no there is not a belief amongst you know a lot of Americans that. The Department of Justice will serve the justice that serve um, justice to all Americans. That you have a president who would uh, treat all Americans fairly, who would care about all Americans, and those were borne out by the fact that the Trump administration uh, was seeking to politicize the protests and took the unprecedented step of using essentially federal troops to fire on peaceful protests, protesters in Lafayette Park. So I, I mean, I guess my view of the situation, and I think this is, you know, something that Biden is talking about a lot, is that, you know, the country has, has always needed to deal with the scourge of race, but we will never deal with it if we have leadership who seeks to uh, politically benefit from racial division instead of showing leadership to solve it. Richard, before asking you, what's your take on this obviously very, very delicate and pertinent topic, I'm going to um, ask uh, to encourage all our participants in the webinar to, to, send, uh, to send our questions because uh, in 20 minutes we're coming 
to a close of this part of our debate and uh, we're gonna dive into the questions from the audience. But Richard, your take on the BLM and, uh, and how did it come about for some of us looking from the outside all of a sudden after the end of the Obama presidency? Well, I think Nir is right that if anybody on the outside thought that the election of Barack Obama meant that racism was over in American <laughs> society, that was just a misreading of American society. Unfortunately, I would love for it to have been the case. That the, mm -hmm. But what it demonstrated, the, what the election of Barack Obama demonstrated was a historic moment by demonstrating that an African-American could be president of the United States. It did not mean that racism has been eradicated in every community in this country and every population and every institution. I wish that was the case, but it just isn't the case. Um, and sometimes the frustration with that fact boils over when you get particularly graphic outrages like George Floyd's murder, um, which you can see on TV and everything else. Um, you know, I have to say the, the Black Lives Matter uh, protests were extraordinary in a couple of ways. One, it was not just the size of the protests, although it was that, it was how distributed they were get all over the country. I mean, mm -hmm. all 50 states had protests going on. Tiny towns had protests. I was, I happened to be down driving in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, and I ran smack dab into a Black Lives Matter protest in downtown Asheville, North Carolina. I mean, all over the South, all over the West, every part of the United States. And, uh, and ultimately what, you know, th th there's a variety of, of, of motivations and, and sort of agenda items when you get hundreds of thousands or millions of people involved in anything. But the fundamental thing that people were asking for was acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. Not that all lives don't matter, these other things, but that Black Lives Matter as much as everybody else's. The black, the black people should not be subject to the kind of police brutality that doesn't seem to be carried out as frequently among white, on white people. If you can't get behind that, irrespective of your political party or what you believe on particular policies, if you can't get back behind that fundamental philosophical point that black lives have been treated as something lesser than other lives in the past and they shouldn't be in the future, it's hard to know what you can get behind. I mean, this should be a unifying thing. And, and frankly, having seen a lot of protests on different issues come and go, I actually, this one feels different. I mean, I'd be interested if, if Mira feels the same way. This one feels different. And, and, it, and it feels like the effect of this is gonna have a staying power well beyond the big marches and things that we've seen the last 20 or 30 years on this issue or that issue. I mean, I see things, businesses changing their practices, mm -hmm. executive changing their thinking, politicians to some degree changing some of their rhetoric. You're not going to change the president of the United States, but I'm talking about, you know, the other 325 million Americans who really do matter in this kind of stuff. So near, I don't know. Near yeah, I would, I, I would just amen everything Richard has said. I mean, I think Richard really captured it well, which is that um, you know, the, the video really made clear the devaluing of a black man's life. I mean, it's just, you know, hard to say, say anything else. And so, and I would, I would agree in my view is that, that it has, you know, I think that there's shifts, sort of cultural shifts and, and systemic shifts and business practice and, and, you know, entertainment and, in how you know people every day are consuming literature and books and you know i really i i mean i have to say what was amazing about the protests um you know there's a there's a great uh, podcast by tanahisi coates on this which is what was really amazing about the you know the protests which is so different from many of the protests in the 60s is um, you know, not just their size, but how multi-generational and multiracial they were, you know, I mean, in many places, it was a majority of whites protesting. Um, you know, I had a similar experience. I was in rural Maryland and, you know, it's places that are a hundred percent white and their Black Lives Matter signs on places, you know, I sort of was expecting a Trump sign to be totally honest and like houses that I would sort of, you know, I mean, you might like four years ago, definitely had some Trump signs. So, 
Um, you know, I do think that it is a, uh, it is a, it, it, it will have a longer lasting impact. And I, because I think people are sort of try, are, are, are grappling with more baseline assumptions about mm -hmm. unconscious bias and things like that. Okay. Uh, that was a very, it was a very fascinating exchange and, uh, and a lot of things to soak in. Uh, I'm going to, Switch now to something that is probably closer to, to Richard, which is foreign policy. And uh, obviously, most of the people agree that the biggest uh, foreign competitor, rival, challenger of the United States in the years and decades to come will be China. Uh, there's very, very little uh, disagreement on that. But when I ask you a question, depending on who wins next week, We'll get to whether we're going to know or not know next week. We won. Uh, we're going to get to that later. But depending on whether we had President Biden or President Trump as of next year in the White House, how different do you think will be the trajectories of U.S.-China relationship? The difference between a Biden uh, approach and a Trump yeah. approach? Well, I, first of all, I, I think that the overall trajectory of U.S.-China relations has changed from um, previous administrations, and and you know the the Trump administration came out early and you know said that great power competition and competition with China was sort of a defining factor of the world we're in today. It labeled China a strategic competitor, um, and you know, those would have been very controversial even a few years ago, but you see general bipartisan support for that disposition. I mean, if you look at the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, or Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, and they're asked about some of these things, they will often say things like, you know, that's the one area where I agree with Trump, or he's not tough enough when it comes, to, or he's got the wrong priorities, but I agree with the disposition. So, so I don't think you're going to see under Biden or Trump a shift back to the general engagement strategy that uh, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama that thought, well, through engagement, diplomatic engagement and trade and, and information flows, China will become more of a responsible stakeholder in the existing international system and that maybe it will even liberalize at home. I mean, I think those those hopes are pretty dashed at this point. And instead, what you're seeing is a United States that wishes to respond to Chinese behavior as we find it, shape it where you can, but respond to where to Chinese behavior rather than believing that through our own decisions, we can sort of dictate China's future, either in the world or at home. And that leads to, I think, a long period of competition between the United States and China in various vectors. You've got the diplomatic side and the sort of contest for allies and friends on the economic side, uh, a contest for influence in different parts of the world, on the technology side, certainly on the military side. And I think that competition is gonna be waged whether or not Trump or Biden is elected. You would certainly see some, I think, uh, differences. I mean, Trump's rhetoric is very confrontational and, and, and a Biden administration's rhetoric may be less confrontational. Um, and I think you would probably see some different priorities. I mean, the, the Trump administration's top priority with China has been to get a trade deal. And the trade deal has been premised on the idea that we need to reduce the trade deficit, which is further premised on the idea that China needs to buy more goods that are made and or sold in key politically important states. So more soybeans, more autos. I mean, the disposition is right, but that agenda is wrong. The, the, the trade deficit is not the right thing to focus on with China. More purchases of soybeans and autos is not the top priority with China. And if you have, if you're building this leverage in the relationship because of the com competition, a Biden administration, or even a Trump too, that doesn't need to get reelected could very easily switch to a better set of priorities um, than the ones that we have right now. Do you think Richard that uh, Barack Obama was too soft on China because he was president only four years ago. And uh, you're trying to suggest, if I understood you well, you're suggesting that potentially Biden administration is going to be as tough or tougher or equally tough or similarly tough to Trump on China. Does it mean that that Biden, that, sorry, that, uh, that Barack Obama was, uh, was too soft or maybe naive with regard to China? 
Well, uh, you know, in retrospect, sure, all of the administrations, including Barack Obama's, could have been tougher on China, but it was, but I think we've learned a lot uh, since the global financial crisis uh, and since Xi Jinping's ascension to power. I think the Chinese have essentially decided that now is their time that the global financial crisis and the continuing dysfunction in the American political system and now in the economy and the health and everything else shows that we're a declining power and they're a rising power that is able to get their economy going faster, build a hospital in a day, make decisions quickly. We're not a, they're not a fractious democracy, uh, get hold of coronavirus faster, all of these things respond, you know, and, and, um, and, and now's the time to move out on their priorities in a quite aggressive way. And, and you see this not just with respect to the United States, but Taiwan and Japan and Europe and the South China Sea and the Uyghurs and Hong Kong, and you can sort of in India and you can kind of go down the list. So, um, you know, the, the, the Obama administration got more skeptical about China over the eight years that it was in office. And, and by the end, I think was taking a significantly harder line with China than it had certainly at, at the beginning. Um, and that's largely true of foreign policy folks on both sides of the aisle in Washington, because we have learned a lot about what we at least now believe to be China's intentions and about what doesn't work. Um, so, you know, is four years ago, many people were saying, well, it's a mixture of cooperation and competition, and we got to make sure that we don't cooperate too fear. I remember, I remember Hillary Clinton saying at some point, she was Secretary of State at that time, I was Foreign Minister of Serbia. Uh, I remember well saying that you can't be tough with your banker. But this is well, you know, if, if, if relations with China are just a mixture of cooperation and competition and you, and you compete too fiercely, then you crowd out the opportunities for cooperation, right? It's just impossible to hermetically seal off climate change and pandemics and nonproliferation from South China Sea and Hong Kong and military competition. And we see that today. I mean, the United States and China both have a gigantic interest in not seeing coronavirus spread, but there's zero cooperation between them. Uh, and in fact, it's a, it's one more vector of competition. Um, but but I think that um, I think what has fallen behind is the idea that through just making the right decisions and approaches in Washington, we can fundamentally shape the underlying nature of Chinese behavior in very big and strategic ways. Uh, you know, they would become more liberal if we did this, or they would become more invested in the international order if we did this other thing. Instead, saying, yeah, we're not going to give up on trying to shape any country's behavior through our foreign policy. But a lot of what we have to do is react to th th these leaders have minds of their own and they have agency and they make their own decisions and they have their own calculation of interest. And we have to take that into account. And that puts you in a different policy making framework and environment than you have if you think that it's sort of a dependent variable over there that we can sort of manipulate. I guess I would I would just add a, a few thoughts to Richard's here. I, I'd say, um, you know, I think that it's my view that um, the thing that aids the the Chinese the most in their argument on the global stage is an incompetent and badly managed United States that repeat that repudiates its allies. I mean, the, the truth is, I mean, this is my view, but the United States and China and the West and China are engaged in a ideological debate about the, on a global stage about what form of government should really be the 21st century model. And China is aggressive in making the case that its form of authoritarianism is more effective. It's more effective at dealing with the virus. It's more effective in growing its economy. It's a better strategy. And American democracies like America are basket cases that can't actually deliver results. And to be brutally honest, I think the Trump is, is the, the model of Trump has been a godsend to the Chinese. And and other variables that the Trump administration finds important, like our trade deficit, they've, it's also been a godsend in that it is a, you know, it is, the, as the I said earlier, the highest it's ever been. So, uh, sorry. This is something that we can probably understand better than other things here in Serbia, because here in Serbia, we're not topping the leagues when it comes to freedom 
and democracy. <laughs> and, uh, and this is something that the current American administration doesn't seem to be terribly miffed about. No, uh, no. So anyway, uh, I mean, I just think that uh, my hope is that a Biden administration will be more effective in dealing with the China competition um, because it will be able to, you know, actually uh, hopefully demonstrate an effective government, but also work more closely with allies, which is really actually the best way to achieve all of our, uh, all the results we want to see in China economically and politically. But maybe I can just add one more word on this, which is interesting with respect to Europe. So um, I do think with the Trump administration in Asia, it's it's something of a mixed bag because you know you we will hear from our allies in places like Australia and Japan that they like the Trump administration's tough approach to China and they worry that it will go away and they believe they stuck their neck out a little bit and all these other kinds of things. Europe uh, is a question, not just for the sort of battle of ideas that Nira was talking about and the kind of sentiment, um, but also because of the economic consequences of all of this. So, you know, Europe is in a recession. It's gonna take a while to get out of it. It's gotta get out of coronavirus first. Um, the Chinese are economic players in a way that they, in a, in a more important way than they've ever been. The Chinese both have capital on offer, markets on offer, and when countries, when governments make decisions they don't like, they are punitive in their economic measures. And I, you know, you, what you're seeing in Europe right now for a whole variety of reasons in many countries is growing skepticism about the role of the Chinese. And you can see this manifest itself on Huawei and all kinds of other things. Yeah. However, I can imagine foreign ministers and defense ministers in Europe being very skeptical on China, finance ministers and prime ministers saying, okay, that's great, but we got to grow this economy and provide jobs because we got to get out of this recession. And if you're going to risk access to Chinese capital and Chinese markets, you're going to have to think pretty hard about how high the priority uh, that's going to be. And so the sentiment could, could run into economic realities in Europe and how that's gonna net out, I think will be determined country by country and leader by leader, but I don't think it's all gonna be on one side or the other. Well, uh, thank you very much. We're coming to an end uh, of, this, uh, of this section, but I need to ask you one more question, each of you, and if you can keep your comments to no more than a couple of minutes, I'd be very grateful so that we can dive in also to the questions asked by the audience. My uh, my last question to Nira in this section is going to be uh, how sure we can be that on November 4, we are going to know who is the next president of the United States and which non-impossible scenario for November 4 uh, you fear the most. Okay, I'll be brief. No one should expect to know the results on November 4th. Like no one should expect to know the results on November 4th for the very reason that unless the Supreme Court intercedes in more states over the next seven days, uh, the many states will allow votes to be postmarked, mail-in ballots will be to be postmarked on election day to be counted. So that means that uh, for several days after the election, votes will come in. This is not unusual in the United States. Multiple states have had these rules. California is a very large state. It has these rules. If you just get your ballot into the mailbox and have it marked in the mailbox on election day, then it will be counted. So uh, we should not, you know, my hope is that it's a kind of blowout election, but you know, what everyone should expect is that we will not know the outcome in Michigan or Pennsylvania until after, until, you know, maybe days after the election. And I appreciate that Donald Trump will argue that he has won. Um, and he may make the, you know, the, the most common scenario is Republicans are, are planning to vote in person on election day. Democrats are voting early. Um, but definitely voting by mail so that on election day, what it may look like in several states that Trump has won if you're just counting those votes. So I don't, you know, I just need to say that that is not counting every vote. I'm deeply hopeful that um, our media will not count, uh, will make clear how the balloting 
is not actually uh, counted. You know, I mean, there's a variety of concerns. I'll just run through them. There are concerns I've never had to have an election. I certainly didn't have to worry about these things during the McCain-Obama race. So, you know, but the things we need to be worried about are abuses and abuses of power and uh, ex extraordinary acts, whether we'll have violence or terrorism at polls. You know, never need to really worry about that in the past. I definitely worry about it now. Whether we'll see ICE, uh, we'll see our immigration enforcement um, engage in um, essentially raids uh, in cities across the country. That could happen. They've already talked about California raids. We know that families that have uh, citizens and non-citizens in them tend not to vote if they're worried about raids. So, you know, that's another concern. There's uh, the broad, just broad concern of any kind of lawlessness within the administration over the next week, of which I can only imagine. I would say um, we did have a kind of conflagration around issues of Hunter Biden over the last several weeks, which I even, as a, I watch politics pretty clearly, I mean, pretty intently, and I, even the, to me, I do not fully understand what the actual accusation against Joe Biden is in, this, in these cases. Um, but anyway, that seems to have come and gone. So I have less concern about that. My last question for Richard is, uh, if you were to advise the next president of the United States, Joe Biden or Donald Trump, uh, what would be the very first thing you believe that he ought to do upon taking the oath? Pause. Don't make dramatic news. Don't tweet, <laughs> take things in deliberately, restore some sense of normalcy to policy making, and, uh, and then give a speech uh, about um, actually how the country can come together irrespective of our divisions. Very good advice. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. I don't know if anybody's going to follow that, but. Well, thank you very much, guys, for uh, we're ending this section um, of our debate. It was a very, uh, spirited debate as I had expected uh, in the past. Uh, now we're going to move to the questions from the audience that came uh, before and during uh, this conversation. And the very first question is asked by my uh, good and old friend Mehmet Shimshek, uh, the former Minister of Finance of Turkey, uh, who is watching us right now. And he asked the question to both of you really uh, what is the U.S. election uh, outcome? What will be the best U.S. election outcome for the market? Mm. Uh, oh, sorry. Or near, sorry. No, no, near, go ahead. Near. Do you want to go ahead? Anyway, no, I mean, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's hard to say. I mean, you know, anecdotally, um, one hears a lot of uh, concern about a Biden administration that will put in will raise taxes and put in regulations and things like that. Um, on the other hand, a Biden administration that's more effective in eradicating coronavirus wouldn't be bad um, for the economy. So I, I don't know how that uh, ends up netting out. I mean, the and, and, I, and I would just point out that we've got this very strange phenomenon going now, going on now, where the markets <laughs> seem to bear very little resemblance to what's happening in the real economy. And so it is a, uh, a measure of how some Americans are doing, but not certainly the only one. Yeah, I think the truth is that what's uh, really hurting the economy right now is that we have uh, a virus that's raging out of control. And um, the only way to actually deal with our economic problems is to uh, manage the virus. And the, I think sort of most economists understand that. And, um, you know, Donald Trump has no, to this day, has no national plan to deal with the virus and leads uh, fighting the virus to the states, which has zero track record of working anywhere in the world, given that the virus is able to uh, spread between states. <laughs> There's really no reason to think a state can handle it more effectively than a federal, national government. So I think that's the case. I'd also say that the reality is that we have lots of lived experiences with um, the kinds of policies that Joe Biden is proposing, which is essentially to raise taxes on the very wealthy. Um, and uh, invest that in people. And it's not very dissimilar from what we saw in, as 
public policy in the 1990s or in the but in the Obama administration and he's not planning to you know raise taxes to you know some like Kennedy era levels really to get back to essentially what was the tax code over a decade ago, a decade and a half ago. So, um, uh, you know, so I think the there's, I'm sure, anxiety amongst the super rich about paying more taxes, but that's in fact incredibly popular in the country and would restore some sense, I think, of, um, of an economy that may work, work better for more people. Great. Well, thank you. Next question is from another old friend, Kritonas, uh, from Greece, uh, also a former minister, former senior official of the Greek government. Uh, the question is for Richard. Uh, if you were to choose, uh, who would have been the best candidate for the Republican Party in this election? It's <laughs> a great um, question. That's a go. You know, I've given that zero thought because it, <laughs> so far, I mean, you know, th th there were these rumblings that feel like forever ago that John Kasich was going to enter in, in the Republican primary and and go head to head, uh, or you know, Mike Bloomberg who ended up running as a Democrat, or you know, whoever. Um, but I don't know. I. I I would have to give that some thought. I was in in the beginning of 2016. Um, I was a uh, one of the foreign policy folks on the Jeb Bush uh, campaign, which uh, and then for two weeks I moved over to the Rubio campaign, and then he quit. And then in October of 2016, I did an event with Hillary Clinton, and all three ended up losing. So I don't know who would have been a good candidate this time around. I'm probably not a good person to ask. <laughs> Well, I, I really appreciate uh, your honesty, Richard, on this one. So the next uh, tough question goes uh, to Nira, uh, and Anna is asking this question from Zagreb, from Croatia. Uh, if Donald Trump wins the elections, mm -hmm. what are you guys going to do? I mean, I, I'll just be really <laughs> candid. Like, I think the truth of this election is, and this is, you know, I'm, I'm obviously not a Trump fan. I mean, I think the truth of this election is, you know, the United States either exercises, exorcises the devil or, you know, we are the devil. So if Donald Trump wins re-election, you know, he will, assuming he hasn't cheated or there isn't like ballot fraud or they've burned ballots or there's violence, you know, um, but like if he wins the election fair and square, uh, even, you know, uh, even the fact that we have a, a, a somewhat skewed process from the electoral college, if he wins the election fair and square, square you know, I think he, he can claim a mandate for his, his, for the way his, you know, a mandate for his politics. And, um, you know, I, I think that that's, I'm hoping that's unlikely. The map is expanding to places like Georgia and Texas, which I, you know, find like, which are extraordinary. But if he, if he does pull this off, given the pandemic and everything else that has happened in the country, it will be that, you know, America has such, you know, we cannot argue it's an aberration. You know, it will be that the country embraced this form of politics, this form of division, this form of what I would argue the politics of hate. And, you know, that will define America well into the future. So my follow-up question to this is, okay, if that happens and this, this gloomy scenario starts, uh, you know, unfolding and, and so on and so forth. So what's your recommendation for a country like Serbia? which struggles to uh, to win its democracy back uh, and has a lot of issues related to, to government yeah, I mean, and, uh, and generally state. I mean, you know, democracy. look, I don't, I don't what, think history what's ever- What's recommendation for us if, they're, if, the, if we're going to get rid of Trump? <coughs> I don't think history ever really ends in the sense. So we always have to fight, right? So, um, you know, uh, presidents, re-elected presidents are often weakened. Uh, Obama was definitely weakened in his second term in many, in, in some fundamental respects. So uh, a lot, you know, a lot 
uh, it really depends on how the country reacts and whether a, a, a movement grows even stronger in opposition in the waning years of his, his term. But, you know, I definitely think that it will be a gut punch. <laughs> Uh, uh, it will be a gut punch to Democrats and definitely a gut punch uh, to, I think, you know, in my view, people who believe in the rule of law and democracy and majoritarian rule, because I do think that, you know, Trump is unusual in, in, in amongst Republicans. I mean, I do work, I do more work with the former Republicans than I've ever done in my life. And the issues that really energize them are really fundamental issues like rule of law and democracy and fighting corruption. And I, and so, you know, I think that'll, if the country um, embraces Trump after these many years, then, you know, I think that's just hard to argue that the country I believed in <laughs> still exists. Just to be so, candid. Uh, thank, you. thank you for this, uh, very honest. I really appreciate this. Uh, the next question is for Richard uh, from Igor. Uh, from Sarajevo. Um, obviously, you are not a Trump fan, but if Donald Trump were to win the elections, uh, could you theoretically consider uh, being uh, an advisor in his administration? And if so, what you would recommend him to do first? Now, obviously, since you said that you would advise someone not to tweet and uh, so on and so forth, that's in, in this particular scenario, if Trump wins the election, I think it's hardly uh, an imaginable scenario. But uh, would you accept uh, to be Trump's advisor in the second term? And uh, what would be the best recommendation that you could give to President Donald Trump? Well, if you are, if the question is, would I work in a second Trump term? Um, that's even less likely than a Republican primarying Donald Trump in 2020. So, um, you know, I think uh, I think we shouldn't um, spend too much time on the impossible. Um, but as you know, as outside advisors, I mean, I, I work at a think tank, and uh, and my colleagues and I um, spend a lot of time trying to uh, provide good ideas and advice to the Trump administration. Um, both those of us who don't seek his reelection and those of us who do, because at the end of the day, it's the American administration. And between the binary choice of that you get on election day, there's all kinds of gradations um, about what good and bad policy looks like. And I'd rather see good American policy rather than bad American policy. So, you know, I mentioned earlier some of the things I think the administration has done well. Um, if there's a second term, I think it could build on some of those things. I would hope that some of the policy positions is taken um, with respect to some of the issues we were talking about before on you know, NATO and troops in Europe and things like that um, could shift. But you know, there's a lot of uh, people in the current administration that are trying to do good jobs under some pretty difficult circumstances. And I think all of us should be in the business of trying to help them succeed and uh, to, you know, informing good policy rather than um, the alternative, I guess, would be to sort of, you know, solely be in opposition. And at least I don't want to do that for just four years. I, I think we should all be in the business of trying to improve the quality of the policy, whatever the administration is, knowing that we all have pretty strong views about who should be leading that administration. We don't always get what we want. A uh, question for my friend, uh, Mike Milosevic, my good friend from Novi Sad. Uh, if Donald Trump wins elections, do you expect violence in the streets of the United States? Question presumably to both of you guys. Uh, if my view is if Trump wins, I think there'll be mass protests. I don't, I don't think that there'll be, I mean, I don't think there'll be significant violence, just like as we've learned over the last several weeks, there actually hasn't been some, there's been, there's definitely been violence, but we are learning more and more that a lot of the violence that we've seen in Kenosha and Portland actually came from white nationalists, like the Proud Boys, which is news in the last couple of days that they were uh, driving a lot of that violence. So um, I don't, ex you know, I don't actually expect my own views. I, I, I do expect large scale national protests. I do not expect, um, I do not expect a lot of violence. 
So that's my, Richard, do and you, do you know, think I think that? actually Democrats would argue against any violence anywhere. Do you yeah, agree I mean, that? violence is possible, but I think it's unlikely. Um, and I think there's a, 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 I think there's a decent scenario where we know the winner on election night and all of the nightmare scenarios that we're talking about and the litigation possibilities and all these other things just kind of evaporate. Um, I'm not really great at predicting anymore, um, given what's you know transpired over the past four years. But I think that's a pretty solid possibility, um, and and I think that uh, I, I think the possibility of violence is relatively low. My, I actually agree. I mean, I would say that we have a greater likelihood today that the election will be called on election night than, you know, that we're facing like mass violence or mass protests because of a, you know, a very, like a clear Trump win. So my last question is uh, actually our, our audience last question is from Maria Georgievich, uh, my, uh, my good friend. Maria Georgievich, uh, who's asking, uh, irrespective of the outcome of the American elections, how do you see the possibility for U.S. society to have the political polarization reverted? As a closing, uh, as a closing thing. To I'm sorry. What was the last word? Reverted. Uh, reverted. The okay. polarization undone uh, after the elections. Okay. Can I jump in on this one? Yeah, sure. I've got to you know, keep going back and forth behind me anyway. So <laughs> I, um, I, you know, I think that there's a, a lot to uh, learn from other countries. Um, so I think if Joe Biden is elected, he will, uh, you know, he will do what he's done throughout this campaign, which is argue he's going to be a president for all Americans. And I think, as I said earlier, he will have some Republicans in his in his cabinet, that doesn't mean that he will, you know, give up on his agenda and not aim to pass his bills, um, you know, but I think he will make some attempts to reach out to Republicans. Um, but I also think that there's a lot that we have to think through as a country, you know, we have to think through our social media platforms, we have to think through, you know, the how we how our politics really is and divisions in the country. But I also think there are lessons in history. I mean, I'm not I'm going to talk about something which is not an exam. I'm not I'm not making an, a, a comparison between the United States and like Hitler. OK, but, but, you know, like if you think about what happened in 19 in 1947, many German thinkers thought the future of Germany was over because of the level of division, obviously what had happened and transpired in Germany. And, you know, that is far worse than anything that has remotely happened in the United States. But here we are, you know, like uh, three quarters of a century later. And, you know, Germany is at this point uh, much more of a beacon of democracy than say the United States. So, you know, they, they went through a, the deepest chasms you can go through as a country and managed to think through how they restore democracy, invest, you know, really invest in a sense of mutual trust and obligation, which, you know, took decades of work to do. But I don't think a country that is in that is in some ways broken cannot fix itself. And the truth about American history, I mean, the 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 compelling just reality of our history is that we face the deepest of chasms. We have, you know, the eight elections of 1864, the election of 1932, where we stare into the brink of America essentially becoming an American. And we always pull back. We always, you know, we always regenerate. In fact, in those moments, in a sense, we build a stronger majority in response. And my work over the last three and a half years has been to try to build a stronger majority in the breach that Trump has created to build, you know, to make the election of Trump an inflection point in the country where we reject his politics by large margins 
uh, the political nihilism, the division, and we build back, I hate to say it, better, stronger, a more united country. I think that is possible. We will know in the next seven days. The playing field of this election is not narrowing, it is expanding. So I am I'm hopeful that 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 regeneration can happen in the in the post-election period because I think a clear majority actually wants that. But you know, the test of this theory will be meted out in uh, eight days, seven and a half days from now. Or maybe a little bit more because. because <laughs> well, we'll we'll know if we're we'll know if we're uh, have a strong majority against him yeah. by seven and a half days. Well, thank you very much, Nira, for this. Uh, spirited uh, closing and uh, the last word goes to Richard. Same question. Yeah, I, I think America's ability to renew itself and to recreate its own democracy, despite all of the flaws that we've had since the founding, um, is been a historical fact, a historical pattern. And it's a bit of a faith-based exercise that it'll continue, but I think uh, there's pretty strong grounds uh, to believe in the vitality of American democracy, as opposed to even a four or eight year snapshot that you take at any moment in our history. Um, you know, the, it's a big question about how do you do these things because there's a political incentives aspect of this, the politicians feel incentivized to divide or to unite. There's, um, there is a structural kind of voting aspect to this. There's a, a money in politics aspect to this. And there's also the issue that, you know, you need two things to make democracy work effectively. One is a shared sense of reality. And the other is some basic level of trust. And right now people can almost choose their own reality. You can choose what information to consume. You can believe in a version of the world where the pandemic is the worst thing in the world or it's not really happening at all, which sounds amazing um, given that we're all living through it, but that's kind of where we are. So I think there's multiple things um, in varying degrees of difficulty that can be done. Um, but I guess the, the other thing is if you look at American history, when we've had big national challenges, particularly challenges from outside, it's helped concentrate on the mind, the mind on just how much actually does bring Americans together. I mean, leave the, pol the politicians out of it for just a second. Um, you know, the bottom line is for all of our divisions, we do treasure the American way of life. We do treasure democracy and our basic values um, and don't wanna see those come under threat. And when we are in a world where, you know, we're under increasing pressure from China and Russia and other countries that feel threatened by that way of life, then my hope is that we shouldn't go out and seek tensions with any country just to have them. But if we're gonna have those anyway, that we can use those as a way to sort of renew the, the bipartisan commitment to American democracy, because the only way we're gonna be successful in this is if we're successful at home. We can't, whatever you think beating China or Russia, whoever looks like, we can't do it. If we are so divided, we can't generate national solutions to big problems. Uh, we have to have a measure of, of political and social unity. And, and using that external stimulus which we shouldn't go out and seek on our own, but if it's there anyway, if we can use that external stimulus mm -hmm. to try to bring some people together around common solutions, then we're starting to get back on the track where we realize that the they is not the American down the street who favors a different political candidate or watches a different cable news station. The they are the people who feel threatened by the American way of life as opposed to those who treasure it. And that's what I hope we can get to. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys. Uh, it was an exceptional privilege to be to be a part of the discussion to help uh, to help steer the discussion. I wasn't really I didn't really feel like uh, uh, being a moderator. I felt more like being a participant in this. Thank you very much for spending the time with us. Thank you very much for sharing your thoughts and views with the audience and. Uh, Southeast Europe and, uh, and other parts of the world. It was a fascinating exchange and uh, please stay tuned with the Center for International Relations and Sustainable Development. Uh, those of you guys who have 
uh, being part of this conversation are going to receive uh, for free the PDF of the entire uh, journal. Uh, it's an exceptionally well done uh, issue on America at Crossroads. Uh, thank you very much for being with us this thank evening. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nira. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.